Good morning, and let's get started. I'm Lauren Cuby with ASU's Global Futures Laboratory, the Julie M. Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm honored to introduce our moderator, Ambassador Amanda Ellis, who's the Senior Director of Global Partnerships and Networks for Arizona State University's Julie M. Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory. Amanda is a development economist who most recently was the New Zealand ambassador to the United Nations, an inaugural ambassador for women and girls. Before that, she was lead specialist gender at the World Bank Group, where she founded the Women, Business, and the Law Project. Amanda, welcome. Thank you so much, Lauren, and I'm truly delighted to be moderating and pleased to welcome everybody from around the world to today's launch for the groundbreaking book from Oxford University Press in their renowned comparative politics series. Reimagining the Judiciary, Women's Representation on the High Courts Worldwide. Now, high courts play a vital role in safeguarding women's rights and protecting rights gained in other venues. This book examines the factors that facilitate the inclusion of women on high courts. And while progress has been made, Women are increasingly being appointed to high courts in every region around the world. We just wish it were faster. We know that political and legal institutions can either promote or block these gains. So today we have the four authors joining us. Maria Escobar-Lemon of Texas A&M University, Valerie Hoekstra from ASU, Alice Kang from the University of Nebraska, and Mickey Kittleson from ASU. So to open, I am just thrilled to welcome our keynote speaker, who is an absolute role model of mine, Sandy Okoro, the Senior Vice President and General Counsel at the World Bank Group and Vice President for Compliance. Sandy is going to set the stage for today's discussion. But first, I want to introduce her properly. A British national, Sandy is a groundbreaker herself, the first black woman to hold this important role at the World Bank. She was also top 20 global general counsels in 2019, named by the Financial Times, recognized as Britain's fifth most influential person of African and African Caribbean heritage by the Power List in 2018. And she holds honorary doctorates from a number of prestigious universities. She received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the UK Black Solicitors Network and has received the Howard University 2019 Vanguard Women Award for her accomplishments as a woman of color who has blazed the trail for others. And that is really the wonderful thing about Sandy. She is the kind of person who has broken through that glass ceiling, but she's picking up all the shards of glass behind her, sweeping it up, and then clearing the way for other women to come behind. So Sandy, you're an ardent defender, I know, and a champion for women's empowerment, gender equality, and justice. We know Justice Ginsburg wrote about the way pavers, and that's really the way I see you in the judiciary and the legal commitment. You have had such an impact on young people who aspire to careers in law. So I'm hoping that you'll share your experience today of your time as a young girl, which was a story that I just found so powerful. And I know that you have also launched a couple of recent initiatives empowering women who are balancing the law and their law society's compact and forum on SDG 16. So a lot of things for you to tell us. Sandy, so thrilled you're here. The floor. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Just checking everybody can hear me. Okay, I assume you can. Um, so um, can, can someone say you can hear me okay? Because I kind of lost a bit of connection there. Hear you. Yes, we hear you. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Thank you very much, Amanda, for that wonderful um, introduction and really kind words. Sometimes when I hear that, it doesn't sound like it's me, but uh, it definitely is me. And I'm delighted to join you all. 
today. So let me say um, a little bit about my background and my childhood, because sometimes when you have these big titles and uh, you do these big jobs, people think that that was bound to be the way it should be. You know, obviously um, it was, uh, you know, meant to be, etc. It certainly wasn't in my case. So I grew up in, um, you can tell by my accent, in, in the UK. Um, I um, grew up in a part of London, South London, called Balham. And when I was at school, I was about seven years old. The teacher was going around the class asking everybody uh, what they wanted to do when they grew up. And I was really ready for this answer. And uh, she came to me and she said, Sandy, you know, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I said, I want to be a judge. And she turned around to me in front of the whole class, much to my embarrassment, and said, Sandy, but I'm sorry, little black girls from Balham don't become judges. And of course, that's a really embarrassing thing to hear, particularly when you're seven. You always want to give the right answer. Um, but somehow something in me, deep, deep inside me, I can't really describe it, thought, mm, well, if they don't, uh, they're going to now, and I'll be the first one then. Of course, that wasn't true. There were others out there, but I just was not aware of them. But that idea that because of my gender and because of the color of my skin, two things that I was born with and had no choice about, um, somehow were going to stop me doing what I wanted to do was just not going to be my story. But what it did tell me, Amanda, is that you know, for many others, they may have thought, well, that has to be true. You're a teacher in authority, you must know. Um, and this happens to so many people. Uh, along the way. They are told things about their limitations, not their can do, but their can't do's. And I really think that is, um, you know, deeply unfortunate, which is why I have really tried to be, uh, now I've got into that position, a voice of change, a voice of change for the future, using my role, uh, using my voice and agency uh, to change uh, the world. You know, I, I get paid to do my job at the bank and it's the most fantastic job. But with that comes the opportunity to convene. With that comes the opportunity uh, to talk and to speak about things that are important. And I do that. So you mentioned empowering women um, by balancing the law. And, um, and you were involved in women business in the law when you were at the bank. And what we're trying to do is pick up those laws that uh, you and others have identified to say these are the laws that hold women back in the world, discriminatory laws on the books in our member countries. My team now, with the help of others that we're all getting together um, and external um, uh, resources as well to say, right, we are going to change those laws on the books with the willingness of our member countries, come to us, come to the bank, we'll help you do that. Uh, to try and balance that out. We can't change culture, we can't change behaviors, but we can change rights and rights are where it all starts. And when I look back at what was said to me, um, no matter how discouraging that was, I did have the right to become a judge if I wanted to. There were no laws in the books that said I couldn't. And that's what's really important. We do need those fundamental rights. So I really believe uh, in that. Um, and just as a little bit of a sandwich uh, to that story, that obviously was a long time ago when I was a little girl. But let's not, let's not um, fool ourselves that these things go away. So on, Mon on Tuesday this week, I'm, I'm in London at the moment. Um, I am, I won't mention where, but I'm a master of one of the inns, which is a very important um, position, an honorary position to be in. So it's like a master of the bench, uh, and one of the inns of courts here in London. And I went with a friend for lunch, the first time I've been since I've been made um, a master. And you sit on this top table uh, where all the masters sit. And it was lunchtime, and it was just the two of us. So I thought maybe no masters are coming in today, it's just the two of us. And one particular master came, gave us a bit of an odd look, I thought, and sat right next to me, even though there were many other places to sit. And I thought, OK, I think I know what's going on here. They're thinking, what are you doing here? Who, who are you? That kind of thing. Then I went back today because actually there was an exhibition there and my, my photograph was on the exhibition as, um, you know, a black um, person who's been a trailblazer in the law and is associated with the inn. And, and I was there, Mia Motley was there, um, Danae, um, Many others were there as well, many other famous uh, black men and women who've gone through the inn, and it was great. So my poster was actually on the wall for others to see. So I went back today to get a photograph of the poster, and um, someone there said to me that you do know what happened when you came in, don't you? That there were other masters there, but they didn't sit at the top table because you were at the top table, and they didn't feel comfortable sitting with you because they don't often see many black faces in the inn. 
even though my face was on the wall in the exhibition, even though I'm a master. And the master who came up to me and I thought was giving me a bit of a funny look was in fact supporting because he said, I'm going to sit next to her. The, all of you are, are just being terribly foolish. And uh, she's a famous master, Ian, and, we're going to, um, and I'm going to go and sit next to her. I didn't know that's what he was doing until today. But I tell you that sandwich of a story in that even though that happened to me when I was a child, this kind of issue, even when you get to the big titles I've got to in the big jobs and the influence I have, still happens. Um, and this is why we really have to make a difference. We have to find our voice and agency. We can't let things put us off and we really must forge forward. So there's a little sandwich of a story for you, Amanda. That was beautiful, Sandy. Thank you. And it's such an important reminder as to why being a voice of change is so important. And I love your can do, not can't do. Uh, so thank you so much for being such a support to other women and for being such a role model. We're so grateful to have had you here. And please feel free if you're able to stay and listen. We understand you're in London and may be very busy, but I'm thrilled now to introduce the authors of the book. So thank you again, Sandy Okoro, uh, Senior Vice President and Legal Counsel at the World Bank. Now to hear from one of the authors, delighted to introduce from uh, Texas A&M, Maria Escobar Lemon. And the audience, please feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A at any time. So on behalf of Mickey Kittleson, Alice Kang and Valerie Hoekstra, the co-authors, Maria is going to be presenting some of the main ideas from this groundbreaking book, Reimagining the Judiciary. Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you for coming to our party. This was envisioned as a chance to say thank you, to celebrate the completion of this book and to celebrate the hard work that has gone into this. Um, but we really feel that in the course of working on this, we accumulated so many debts of gratitude. So thank you for everybody, to everybody for taking time out of your schedules to be here today. Thank you to the people who we see who are on here, who interview, who we interviewed and provided data for the project. Thank you to our colleagues who read previous copies of it, who read drafts of chapters and provided lots of comments. Thank you to the RAs who helped collect and code data. And thank you to everyone who helped make this a better project. It is what it is because of your help. Uh, I specifically also want to acknowledge the College for Global Futures at Arizona State University, who's facilitated this wonderful webinar and brought this, us together. So thank you. And last but certainly not least, we owe a big thank you to the National Science Foundation, without whose financial support we would not have been able to complete this project. The Collect data collected both the quantitative and qualitative data that form the basis of the book, the quantitative data which we are able to share via our website and through the ICPSR data repository were facilitated by NSF. And so we're grateful for their financial support. At the same time, we also acknowledge anything we got wrong, that's on us. That is certainly not NSF's fault. Um, so it seems odd in this group who is committed to gender equality, who is committed to the inclusion and full participation of women to start with this, but we thought we would tell you a little bit about where we got started on this project. This project came about because we realized there are more and more treaties that recognize women's rights. But gains made in those treaties can be lost if courts later do not uphold the rights promised in those treaties or systematically interpret laws in ways that limit or minimize the rights that women have gained in other venues. This increasing importance of the judiciary, which political scientists have referred to commonly as the judicialization of politics, has been happening worldwide. At the same time that courts have become increasingly important venues for the maintenance of rights, there has also been 
increased importance to who sits on the benches. And one of the things we started out with with this project was the idea that it would be relatively straightforward to collect the data on who sits on these benches and how many people there are. Um, and I know you're all muted, so I can't hear the number of people who've laughed, who've heard me say, oh, this will be an easy data project. This turned out to be much something that really there was not data on. And that lack of systematic data is something that really has hindered the ability of individuals to hold selectors to account because we don't know what the composition of these bodies are. And so we set out to address this absence of global data and then addressing this, once we address this absence, to look at how women gain access to these courts and identify some of the factors that facilitate the advance of women. Um, the theory we're going to talk about and the theory we argue for in the book is a multifaceted theory that you that argues that it is the confluence of domestic institutions, supply side pipelines and global influences that all work together to help advance women's representation on high courts. We realize the literature to date has emphasized the important role of pipelines and domestic institutions, in particular selection mechanisms, in advancing women, but that less attention has been systematically, play, systematically paid to the role of international influences. And so incorporating all of these and helping to bring them together is one of our theoretical contributions. Um, at this point, I also want to put a brief note in about terminology on this. You'll notice throughout the book, we've used the term high courts, and we're going to continue to use that nomenclature today. Part of why we've settled on the term high courts is that we wanted terminology that captured both Supreme Courts in countries like the United States, where there is a single peak court, as well as constitutional and final court of appeals, courts of cassation, or other apex courts in countries with a split bar, with a split court system. So this term high courts captures and encompasses both of those kind of things. So that's why we use the term high courts in case someone's wondering why we didn't just talk about supreme courts, um, because we wanted this inclusive language. Um, we favored a multi-method approach in the book, um, and we, in, we have married a quantitative global data set, which is available for download at our website. Please visit our website after the presentation is over, of course. Um, download our data. Um, we, we are happy to make this data available. Um, so our book takes the approach of combining this qualitative, this quantitative data with a uh, qualitative approach. For those of you who've seen some of our other presentations, you'll know that we have two data sets that are available. One that tracks the first appointment of the first women to high courts around the world. The second of which tracks the number of and the percentage of women sitting on high courts. Um, we attempted to collect for the world all sovereign countries with a population over 20, 000, uh, over 200,000 from 1970 up to the present time. Um, we did a relatively good job. We were not able to get everybody. As I said, this turned out to be a little harder than we thought it would be. Um, and we admit we don't have everyone, but those of you who read the data appendix in the book will see that we do some analysis that shows we're not missing data systematically from any part of the world. Um, and we do have some pretty broad coverage in there. So there's the global data set you'll see. We've combined that with case studies of Canada, Colombia, Ireland, South Africa, and the United States. As part of our qualitative data collection, we interviewed members of the judiciary, employees of the judicial branch, members of non-governmental organizations, people from um, advocacy organizations, journalists, academics, selectors, a variety of people involved in the process. We also relied on archival research and um, newspaper articles and secondary sources. So that's the basis for the case studies. Um, a couple of notes about key findings. I've got a couple of those. Um, in terms of what we find in a quantitative sense, globally, women have made significant inroads 
in high courts, compared with the numbers in 1970, when all male courts were not only the norm, but almost universal, by 2012, women, were, women held over 20% of the seats on high court. At the same time, I know some of you are looking at this graph and saying only 20%. Um, yes, there is still room for progress. Those gains that women have made, though, have not been made equally around the world, and there is some significant variation across region. So we see variation across region is one thing, but we also see significant gains for women taking place both in the global north and in the global south. And so women exceed 30% of the bench, both in some in parts of Latin America and Africa and approximate that in Africa, as well as approaching over almost approaching 40% in parts of the West and Scandinavia. So we see regional effects that don't map to the global north global south divide. Um, we also found relatively few instances, but not zero of courts that have gender parity. So we have we uncovered 17 instances where a high court achieved parity. And there's a note of caution on the achieving parity. The way we've defined parity here is a relatively high bar because parity is, def we define, have used parity here as 50% or more, which means if your court has an odd number of members, which is very, very common, women have to be more in order to cross that 50% bar. Um, but nonetheless, we have 17 instances where women did achieve a majority of the, high, of the high court. And those of you who are looking at this list may be thinking, wow, these are not necessarily, if you'd asked me to write down 17 countries where I thought this would have happened, this would not necessarily have made my list. And part of this reflects the fact that gains are happening in some expected and some unexpected places as well. And so I want to turn very briefly to a couple of notes that we have that grow out of the case studies we conducted in the second part of the book and talk about what works for advancing women. And we frame this as a need to reimagine challenge and change in order to help promote women's representation based on those based on our findings. One of the first findings is that it's important to reimagine courts and as part of reimagining that specifically reconsider who can be a judge and Sandy's story at the beginning was so perfect as an example of this because involving women and gaining representation really involves reshaping and rethinking who can be a judge and what our norms are we also want to encourage rethinking about what qualifications are needed what is required in terms of experience and where one looks to find those judges. Um, by breaking those, that helps reimagine and helps to diversify the judiciary. Pipelines in all five countries are full. It's a matter of look, looking for the women where they are. Um, second is A uh, second lesson is to challenge the status quo and challenge institutions. In several of our cases, advocacy organizations played an important and significant role in challenging the status quo and contributing to change. In both South Africa and Colombia, non-governmental organizations placed public pressure on electorally accountable selectors, who then in turn felt compelled to be more inclusive in their nomination strategies. And so the actions of those groups helped elevate concern about, are there women? Why are there no women? And helped push women who should have been being considered all along into consideration. This active, this role is, in, is really something that we found to be important in our studies. Additionally, we also find a third note that windows of opportunity enable change. And there almost should be a but that effect is limited on this slide. Theoretically, our quantitative studies show that when a new court is created whole cloth, there tends to be a more attention to representation. There tends to be thoughtfulness in the composition and women tend to break in at that point in time. But those effects are often very transient and very short lived. And so while in many cases, a brand new court might have women, it often then reverts to having one or no women on it. And so big windows of opportunity do enable change, but other things are needed to really have that long-term transformation. 
In conclusion, as I know I'm running short on time, the court composition matters for ways that go beyond gender. Um, we emphasize and encourage this reconsideration of who can be a judge. And by this, we also want to encourage not thinking not only about including women from the dominant group. True justice and equality require an intersectional approach that considers multiple and overlapping sources of inequality and privileges. And so including women means including a full and diverse range of women and men on the courts. It also means tracking progress and setbacks. Data efforts like this really help us know where the women are and where they aren't. And finally, having that data enables pressure to continue to be applied on selectors, to follow through, to make commitments to CEDAW, to actually continue to report on progress that has been made. Through all of this, a, re re a diverse judiciary can be reimagined and more and inclusive voices can be brought to the judiciary. We are so excited you came. Thank you, everyone. And I'm super happy to hear what our panelists have to say about the book. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Maria Escobar-Lemon, Associate Dean of Texas A&M University. Just a brilliant overview. And I think really showing us the critical role of courts in upholding women's rights and why it's so important who actually sits on the benches. And this is a wonderful segue now for our next speaker. This point about the lack of systemic data was really the reason why we started the Women, Business and the Law Project at the bank. We were seeing the impact in women's everyday lives all over the world from something as simple as whether a woman's legal right to have property was upheld. And actually going out and collecting these laws sometimes in person <laughs> was, was a big job. But Taya Trombuch and her team are doing an absolutely outstanding job at the World Bank with Women, Business and the Law in the Global Indicators Group. And this is a project that's very, very dear to my heart. We know that in 2021, not a single country in the world had achieved full gender equality. And in fact, only 10 have legislated for it. And it is this ability to systematically review the data and be able to see how we too can reimagine and challenge and change. So Taya, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce you and please give us an overview of women, business and the law. Thank you, Amanda. And it's such an honor and privilege to speak after Sandy and Maria, um, and it's just shocking to hear these stories. It's shocking to hear to see the data that shows how far behind we still are. Although progress has been made, and we should celebrate that. But um, you know, these last couple of years have been very challenging, and they've been very challenging for women. And in times of crises, a legal environment that encourages equal participation can make us less vulnerable. But the reality is that all over the world, many women start at a disadvantage. And one of the reasons for that are discriminatory laws that continue to hold women back from reaching their full potential, which threatens not only their own economic security, but that of their communities and countries too. So at Women, Business and the Law at the World Bank, we have been trying to identify exactly where laws are preventing women from becoming employees and entrepreneurs and contributing to their economy. And over the last 12 years, the project has co continued to present a unique data set that measures progress towards gender equality in the world of work in 190 countries. Our data identifies where discriminatory laws persist and also highlights the opportunities for reform. This includes things like equal pay legislation, the provision of maternity and paternity leave, and whether women can do basic things like get jobs and sign contracts without their husband's permission. Our research has built evidence on the critical link between gender equality and economic growth. And what we find is that gender equality is associated with narrowing the gender gap in development outcomes, higher female labor force participation, and lower vulnerable employment. But there's a lot more work to be done. Our most recent report shows that worldwide, the average woman has just three fourths of the legal rights of the average man. And while legal reform is the first step, we know that gender equality cannot be achieved without the meaningful implementation and enforcement of the law, especially from those that can effectively advocate for women and ensure that their rights are upheld. Over the last two years, 
women business and the law has expanded its research agenda to try and better understand exactly how well laws are being implemented and enforced, including through women's access to justice. And we found that women judges play a vital role in the effective implementation of laws and enforcements of rights. Women's representation in the court system can also contribute to the quality of decision-making and of justice itself. We have also attempted to collect some of this data that Maria alluded to, um, and we understand how difficult it can be. What we have found, um, and we've collected data that is current as of October 1st, 2021, so some numbers might be different. We find that more than 80% of, 80 of the 190 countries that we cover have at least one female justice. However, just 15 have achieved parity in terms of women's representation. In Vanuatu, for example, 50% of the constitutional court's justices are women, whereas in Suriname, women are the majority at 80%. But these countries are, are the exception. Most have not yet achieved parity in high courts. However, we find that 32 countries are just one woman justice away from achieving either gender equality and representation or having a female majority. On the other hand, a complete lack of women's representation on constitutional courts is observed in 24 countries across four regions, East Asia and Pacific, Middle East and North Africa, South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. This may be representative of a lack of representation at all levels of the judiciary. And just 31 countries worldwide have a women chief justice. This is up from 26 that we observed in 2016 when we last did this accounting. Recent exa examples include the Honorable Madam Chief Justice Michelle Aron, who was appointed as the first female Chief Justice of Belize in 2020, and Justice Martha Kuhn, who in 2021 was appointed Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Kenya and became the first female to head any branch of the Kenyan government. What the data clearly show is that women's access to justice and therefore their access to employment and entrepreneurship opportunities is being hindered by limits on their representation in judicial institutions. Inequality can flourish for longer in places where women's perspectives are not represented. In the context of women, business, and the law, this can mean that discrimination in the areas where we see the widest gaps are slower to close. In particular, our parenthood indicator shows significant gaps in the paid leave offered to mothers and fathers, and a lack of shared paid parental leave at the global level. And under the pay indicator, we also observe that 88 countries still restrict the jobs women can do that many fail to mandate equal pay for work of equal value. Our data and website can point to, point to these and other areas in which legal reform is needed. Together with books like Reimagining the Judiciary, it can provide important context by further filling out the picture of the legal environment when it comes to women's rights. We hope to keep exploring this issue and using data like those presented in the book today to keep making the case for gender equality, whether legal or through representation and implementation and enforcement. These ideas are interconnected. Legal reform does not work without representation and vice versa. We welcome any feedback on how we can continue to measure women's access to justice and representation and look forward to continuing the conversation. And remember, we cannot be what we cannot see. So thank you, Maria, Valerie, Alice, and Nikki for continuing to emphasize the importance of inclusion and equality in high courts. We know there's a long way to go, but let us hope to have more examples in the future than we have today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Taya, and a wonderful reminder of that saying, you can't be what you can't see. So uh, very important and wonderful to see those linkages, how critical it is to have the data and to be able to then show the links between the importance of women's representation and upholding women's rights. And then of course, the bigger impact on the economic output and outcomes for everybody. So we know that this is a race to the top and thank you all for the incredible work that you're doing. I'd now like to bring in three discussants to help us with further reflections. So if you could please turn on your audio and video as you're being introduced. Uh, first, Jay Japa Dawuni, who is Associate Professor and Director of the Center for Women, Gender and Global Leadership at Howard University. Dr. Dawuni is a leading expert on gender and the law, international human rights and African politics. Welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Amanda, if I may call you that. 
Yes. And thank you to the organizers for this wonderful um, book launch and discussion. I really am happy to be here and I'll make my comments as brief as possible. First of all, I would like to start with a disclaimer, the lawyer that I am, that I am very much um, biased by this book and the artist because Alice is my good friend. We uh, co-authored a piece on women chief justices in Africa. And I had the honor through um, Alice to also meet Maria, Valerie and Mickey when they invited me to Arizona. So I'm really biased by their knowledge and their skills. So my comments will be biased. Um, and, and so this, this book is really amazing, not just the book and the knowledge and the new ground is breaking, but the fact that they also have provided a data set that we can use and we can build on to help us map women in judiciaries around the world. I would say that the book has done a fantastic job of answering questions, if I can rephrase it in my way, of who can be a judge, where are they located, and how do they get there? So the issue of the who gender comes in, um, some aspects of maybe other identities may come in, um, where they've looked around the world, collected the data, but they have focused specifically on five countries and going deep into those places. And how do they get there? The processes, the formal and informal institutions, the mechanisms that exist at the domestic level, at the international level, and also other issues that come up within the pipeline. So I'm very impressed with the work they've done collectively. And I would say that the qualitative work, mm -hmm. it's also important in the sense that we really get to see through the interviews they conducted with the different actors within these spaces. And of course, the quantitative data, I encourage everyone to read the book and see all the beautiful um, data they've provided and analyzed to help us understand the domestic level, the regional level, and how that compares globally. So really great quantitative data. As an academic, and despite my bias towards all the amazing scholars who wrote this book, I think it's also my duty to point out a few things that I would have loved to see, and also to say that what I may call weaknesses, um, but not in any way detracting from the quality of the book. One is that I would have loved to have more of the reflection from the interviews. So I know that they kind of did an analysis of the interviews, they engaged with the different actors, but for me, being a very qualitative um, oriented person in my research, and I like to use narratives, specifically legal narratives. And that is one of the ways in which um, I, I, you know, kind of tell the stories of women in law. So I would have personally loved to hear the first hand account of the different people they interviewed in the work. So that is just one thing that I found, I kept looking through all the pages and am I going to hear voices? I also think that um, despite that they have a good selection method for the cases they focus on, um, United States, Canada, Colombia, Ireland, and South Africa, I wish there could have been at least one chapter from Asia broadly defined, and also the Caribbean region, which we often tend to forget, even though sometimes it's you know, kind of put into the Latin America Caribbean region. So those are two that I countries or two regions rather that I think could have been added to this, but of course I understand the reasons why they focus on those five. So having said that, I think the weakness of not including those two geographic regions, it's also a strength because what this book does is that it has set the agenda, it has opened new ground for other researchers to do more work in this area. So you have provided us with the data set, you've provided us with in-depth country analysis and the rest of us will have to do the work. So I'm happy to say that your challenge is already being taken up. Alice and I are already in discussions. We're going to continue the work you have done and we're going to look specifically at black women or women of color in courts around the world. Now, I think this links so well to the unfortunate story that we just heard from Sandy, that even in this day and age, that black women or women of color are still being discriminated against even when they are leading the top organizations in the world and top leadership positions. So what do we know about women who are considered black or women of color or even other minority uh, racial categories? Um, for example, Native American, 
in the United States or native Canadian or native in, uh, Australian? What are their experiences on these calls? Do they get there? What impact do they have? And what are their stories? So with that in mind, I'm gonna end here and say that the challenge has been taken. You all have done a great job. I'm very, very impressed with the work and I encourage everyone to read it, to get copies and let's all build up on this great work that has been done and continue the research. So thank you all very much. Wonderful, thank you so much. And great to hear that this work is already spurring other work. Thank you. Now my great pleasure to introduce Valerie Hudson, who is the university's distinguished professor and director for the program on women, peace and security at Texas A&M University. A very distinguished bio as well, a foreign policy named her one of the top 100 most influential global thinkers. And she has developed the Women Stats Database, which is such an important contribution. So good to see you and Valerie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm really glad to be here. Um, I have been following this project literally for years and occasionally Maria would get emails from me. Is it done yet? <laughs> so I am one of this project's biggest fans and I am delighted that it has finally come to fruition. A hearty congratulations to every one of the authors. Um, as Amanda noted, I do run the Women's Stats database, which is one of the largest databases concerning the situation and status of women in the world uh, cross-nationally. We look at 176 countries, all those with at least 300,000 population, um, and we have uh, over 300 variables. Um, so not simply quant quantitative data, but also immense uh, qualitative data as well. Uh, with good coverage from about 1995 forward, from the year of Beijing forward. Um, so I would like to say that um, for literally decades, we have been looking for data about women in the judiciary. Um, it is incredibly hard to find. And so um, I believe that the data set that has uh, been created by the authors is a huge contribution to the literature. Um, and a huge contribution to those who compile data on the situation of um, women. Um, I would like to suggest, as an, and I know that I'm preaching to the choir here, that women's participation in the judiciary matters a lot, not just on high courts, but as prosecutors and as law enforcement uh, officers. Um, journalists often ask me, what are the three top things um, that I would want to do if I had a magic wand and could help elevate the situation of women around the world. Uh, and more women in the judicial branch is always one of my top three. The others are eradicating child marriage and polygyny in case you were interested. Uh, why do women on, the, on courts and in the judicial branch more broadly define matter? Well, in this day and age, I think uh, we know that the, the law usually is fairly even-handed as it's written, not always, but usually, but because the legal system and the law enforcement system was created, molded, and staffed exclusively by men for so many years, I would like to suggest it's become warped by what philosopher Kate Mann calls empathy. Empathy meaning that the law gives men the benefit of the doubt, excuses men, offers them impunity, even under laws that you would think were fairly neutral. Uh, men may get a slap on the wrist for hurting women, though the, the book is uh, thrown at them if they hurt a man. There was a case in Texas not very long ago where a man was given four months for killing his wife but 15 years for wounding her lover. Just yesterday, an article came across my desk showing that in US child custody cases, 80% of the time a mother indicates a father has physically or sexually abused their child, the allegation is completely dismissed. And many times, the mere allegation by a mother 
that such abuse has taken place is cause for the judge to have her lose custody of those children with horrific results, as you can imagine. In some countries, if a woman um, who has been raped actually goes to a police station to report that rape, the police are liable to rape her as well. In other countries that we deem more civilized, such as the United Kingdom, the percent of reported rapes that actually end with a rapist in convicted and in jail is 1.5% of reported rapes. That's not even all rapes, that's only reported rapes, which is pretty much a declaration that rape has been decriminalized in the United Kingdom. So one important way to try to combat legal empathy is clearly greater participation by women in the judicial branch, broadly defined. So this new data set, I think, allows us to begin to quantify women's presence on high courts and hopefully to track changes in a way that we've never been able to before. Um, the, you know, the whole idea that we've gone from virtually nobody in 1970 to 20% now is a statistic but that we actually did not know before this book was published. So I really think it's a huge contribution. Um, and, but I can only imagine as a data nerd who has been running a huge data set for 20 years, that this was a huge lift to collect this data. I know there was no existing repository of these figures. I can only imagine what war stories the authors could tell us about how they got these numbers. And of course, and a, a, a question that I dearly want to ask the authors is, are they going to continue to update the database, given what a humongous lift it was uh, to get the data that they did? Are they planning to continue to do this lift? Of course, being very selfish, I absolutely hope that they're planning to do that, but I would like to hear it from them. Valerie, I think that's such a good question. And I know that others have been asking that in the chat as well. And we have a question from our Regents Professor on Gender at ASU, Sally Kirsch, also asking if the authors were working with the International Women's Judges Association. So I'm giving you brilliant authors a heads up. We're going to be coming to question time very soon and wanting to thank Valerie for that absolutely brilliant insight into empathy. I love that. I'm going to be using that going forward. So thank you so much for those remarks. I now love to introduce Susan Sterrett as our final discussant before we open up to Q&A, who is Professor at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, and she is the former editor of the Law and Society Review and program director at the National Science Foundation. So thank you so much for being here. And uh, Susan, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Amanda. And it's lovely to hear everybody and congratulations once again. Uh, to the authors. What a tremendous accomplishment. I want to uh, riff on what Valerie was just raising to, to um, raise a few themes. So again, I'm going to be raising themes for future research and, and conversations uh, because we've had wonderful summaries of great things the book has done. So just sort of some challenges here. Um, as we think about women on high courts. One is that we can think about women on high courts as mattering simply because employment discrimination is wrong. That, that's a fantastic thing. And that ad addressing, like that's enough of a justification. Um, and, uh, and then where we have a challenge, I think, is that connection between, um, between many women's lives and women getting on Supreme Courts and we can, or high courts. We can think of the connections as two different routes. One is the empathy that, um, that Valerie was talking about, but another one I wonder 
is whether um, whether something else matters, just the public presence of women, because um, or doesn't matter, by the way, um, and that appointment to courts might substitute for working on harder issues like violence against women. Uh, in the chat, you mentioned that you wanted to work on India. Your colleague Natasha Bell has written wonderful work on violence against women in India, which is horrific. And I don't have numbers in front of me, but a lot of women suffer from that here. Um, and for exactly that reason, that and abortion, I noted in your book um, that it was not, not an issue for quite a while for women in Ireland and, um, and Colombia. So, so I think that that's, that's an opportunity to think about how do we think about those relationships? And I don't think we have to think in a narrow instrumental way, that is women judges rule more often in favor of women, um, because that's, that's not necessarily true as a short story and the problems reach well beyond if cases don't, don't go to court and certainly don't go to high courts. So thinking about that relationship, I think is really important to do. And it's not just outcomes, but for example, the inspiration uh, that, that, um, that women offer. I, um, I'll try to keep this really short because I know we're trying to keep these short, but one just sweet story is uh, now Justice Sotomayor, just before she went onto the Supreme Court, um, spoke in multiple places. And when I was at University of Denver, she spoke and we got students from middle and high school to come and they, the boys were in their ties and the girls were in dresses and they did not usually do that. And it was just so touching. And I promise you, they had never read a decision from her about, um, about uh, interpreting disability statutes, for example, or anything else. So that the inspiration, and Sally Kenny's good at talking about this too, might matter as well as far as shaping an ethic for women. So I wanna think about that. So outcomes certainly, but what's this, but not only outcomes and what's this connection between how people live their lives and, um, and again, sometimes subject to horrific violence. Um, another that I want us to think about is that it's just so easy, and I know you folks don't wanna do it, but it is so easy for us to slip into the idea that women will support rights for women. Um, and, and we know that's not true, and we know that that is useful. It, it is perhaps globally, again, getting women on courts can matter, but um, in individual cases, that's not true. So um, for example, it's certainly an issue in the United States where the attorney general for the state of Massachusetts is not on a high court, but that is a route um, for that, argues that women don't need any reproductive rights because they just need family members to help them out when they have children. Um, let's see, uh, and an issue for someone on the Supreme Court. So I wanna note too, another point that um, you want to invite in, and I know that you do because you do talk about a new court is a new opportunity, and I'll finish up um, quickly here. A new court is a new opportunity, but then you can get some backsliding. There is of course a politics to all of this, and we know that, and I wonder, again, for future research, as we see democratic black backsliding around the world, including in the United States and constitutional hardball is what it gets called, um, but not only the United States, I wonder what the relationship is between that and representation of, um, by women at, um, at elite political levels. And I think that that might be an interesting question too, because indeed um, uh, women at elite political levels in courts of appeal in high courts, in legislatures, in presidential offices, can signal um, uh, a commitment to women's rights as human rights, uh, whatever lived experience is, and so that backsliding on that can also signal a backsliding. And I will um, leave it there. Thank you very much for, again, a really exciting project. Congratulations, like everyone, I am in awe of assembling a database from a wide variety of sources because that is time consuming and difficult to do. And I imagine you are indeed, as you have said, you are extremely grateful to your research assistants. <laughs> Thank you so much, Susan. And some good questions there. I'd like it if all of the authors could turn on your videos now and uh, discussants feel free to as well. But we would love to ask some of the questions from the audience. And who would like to take Sally Kitch's question? about the interaction with the Association of Women Judges. Oh, I'd be happy to, and thank you all for your amazing comments. Um, the IAWJ is a hugely important organization 
it actually supported our project from the start. So we want to say thank you to um, International Association of Women Judges. And in our case studies, the IWJ's member organizations come up as very important in keeping the issue of diversity on courts like on the agenda, um, but also providing a space for judges to network and uh, mentor each other at not just the domestic level, but within regions and then globally. And I, I just wanna put as a side note that the ID, IWJ has been doing tremendous work supporting Afghan women judges. And if people are interested in learning about their efforts, um, they've been talking about it on their Twitter, on, um, on their website. But yes, they've been um, extremely important, the story of the rise of women on high courts worldwide. Fantastic, thank you. Another question, in your research, were you able to find relevant information for the courts that have a structure that ostensibly realizes gender equality? Are the women in these courts only from the privileged group? For example, white cisgender member of a high income class. And of course, we heard from Sandy with her story that it is not always the case, but it would be wonderful to know again from the authors, uh, were you able to find this kind of relevant information? Well, I can weigh in a little bit about Ireland. Um, in, I think it's intermixed with both class and because it is a small country, pretty much you have to be connected to the network in, in Dublin and around. And I think that was a huge part of the story. Um, and I'll just leave it at that for that case study, okay. but for sure, yes. Very interesting. I think that does show the value of the case studies too. We know the value of having the data is being able to make correlations and the diversity dividend now has been well mapped over the last decade or so that shows that there is a correlation when you have a significant number of women with generally better outcomes for women. And interestingly, also with climate change in mind for sustainability. But it is fascinating to be able to go into the data in, in the way that, that you have with the case study. And next question, when it comes to women in politics and the selection process for entering races as candidates, we know there are groups and organizations, for example, Emily's List in the United States, dedicated to giving women the recourse and encouragement to run. Are there similar organizations internationally or in different countries serving the same purpose for judicial roles? I'd be happy to... Oh. There you go, Alice. Oh. Yeah, so the IAWJ um, doesn't specifically advocate for individual women, but there are many groups that will do things such as forward nominations, like in South, South Africa, where NGOs can do that. Um, they'll help assemble um, packets to, for women to submit their dossiers, as we found in Colombia. So that is, I think, something that should be looked at more in terms of how local organizations provide support to diversifying the judiciary. Great. And there's another question on coding. And the person generously says, shall I just buy the book and read the appendix? My answer, given that we are one minute before the top of the hour, is yes. And I encourage everybody to buy this absolutely terrific book. Uh, the insights and the panel today the discussants have shown us what a rich landscape this is and how very important it is to not only women's legal rights, but also to women's economic and overall well-being. So thank you all for incredible work. Thank you for really doing a yeoman's job, your woman's job, in terms of the systematic gathering of data and, of course, the opportunity that you have for global influence now. And uh, we are hoping that the new Gender Equality and Governance Index will be able to draw on these data sets uh, to inform that work too. So let us reimagine, let us challenge, and let us help bring about change so that we are able to improve the world, not only for women, but for everyone. A huge thank you for this incredible book to our brilliant co-authors, wonderful panelists and to all of our audience today. Encourage you all to buy this book. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.